hello and welcome to Power Speaking Live. In the words of President Ford, if I went back to college again, I'd concentrate on two areas, learning to write and to speak before an audience. Nothing in life is more important than the ability to communicate effectively. That quote really spoke to me. And I think for some of us, public speaking is a really daunting task, but it is a task we shouldn't avoid. Whether it's giving a presentation at work or doing a speech at your friend's wedding, it can be hard to know where to start. So we're going to be addressing these points and more in the next 60 minutes. Thank you so much for joining us today for what is certain to be an inspiring and insightful conversation. I'm Sarah Palmer, Director of Business Development in EMEA, standing in for Carrie Beckstrom, the CEO of Power Speaking Incorporated, your usual host for this monthly series. Following this event, you can find this and previous episodes on the Power Speaking podcast, and we'll put the link to that site in the chat for your convenience. So today we are going to be discussing how to ensure your next conference talk really wows your audience. And if you'd like in chat, you can start putting down your ideas. I'd like to know what stands out for you when you think of a great confidence conference speaker. So what really stands out for you? Pop that in chat, it'd be useful to see what comes up. Generally, we as the audience decide really quickly if the speaker is worth listening to. So we're going to be looking at what makes that secret source to make you as the speaker really stand out and be remembered. So joining us on the panel today is Rebecca McKenzie. She's the Global Director of Product Marketing for Salesforce. Rebecca, you're passionate about public speaking and storytelling. I know the stage is your is your happy place and you really enjoy delivering keynotes and appearing on stage. So we're looking forward to hearing more and any tips that you can share with our audience. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Sarah. Very, very happy to be here. You said it, the stage is my happy place and you summarized it perfectly for me. So thank you. Very excited for the next hour. Lovely. Thank you. We're also honored to have with us Bonnie Shapira, Corporate Event Planner for Cisco. Bonnie, you've worked tirelessly to bring Cisco Live to the masses in EMEA. This event attracts thousands of Cisco customers and partners year after year, and it's been Power Speaking's pleasure to work with your speakers to ensure they educate, inspire, and often bring a sense of real fun to their audience. So welcome, Bonnie. Thank you. Happy to be here, Sarah, everyone. Looking forward. Fantastic. So uh, let's get started then. And I'll turn to you, Bonnie, first of all, if that's okay. And I'd just really like to ask, uh, what's the most powerful conference talk that you've ever seen and what made it so memorable? So I knew the answer, uh, the, the question before, so I had I'm trying to think about it, but then I realized I would go with, with the first thing that came up with my mind. I actually have two answers. One uh, is a speaker who presented in our last event before COVID in 2020, and his name is Richard Browning, if you ever heard the name. Uh, this guy is, a, is an engineer. He used to work in an oil and gas company up in the North Seas, and he left his job to to basically start his own startup and he basically developed uh, a flying uh, suit for people for men uh, where you basically put uh, real uh, rocket engines on your hands and on your back and you literally fly wow we got him to be our keynote guest keynote speaker for the closing keynote at cisco live 2020. uh it was relatively cheap compared to some other well-known speakers not everyone knew about it. Obviously, people that are really into that knew about it. But the the uh, the one thing that really made the difference is that he was actually walking the talk or actually flying the talk. So he he came on stage flying. Okay, and that made the whole crowd go really crazy. Everyone took their phones out and 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 pictured, filmed him flying from the outside into the into the closed hall, landing right next to our uh, uh, um, Emir. Uh, Cisco leader, and, and that was super cool, especially for the tech audience that is 
uh, attending the event. That was like a mind-blowing thing. The other one that I would always remember is Michael Phelps speaking in uh, one of the conferences and the sales conferences that I attended as a participant because I'm, I'm an avid swimmer and, and seeing Michael Phelps on stage was great. Unfortunately, he did, not, he did not make his way to the stage swimming. So he could have been more convincing doing that. Lovely. I love that. And I might use that as an example. I mean, few speakers can actually fly onto stage, but that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Okay. Um, how about you, Rebecca? Well, mine's not as um, thrilling as Bonnie's example, but I think um, one of, for me personally, one of the most powerful conference talks or speakers um, is actually Stephanie Bouchami. So she used to be the CMO of Salesforce, and she was the CMO when I first started back in 2017. And um, we have Dreamforce, which is our you know largest event of the year. Um, and we do it on this huge stage. And when I saw her come out, I just, the way that she spoke, the way that she captured the stage, engaged with the audience, that's when I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, and ever since then, I've been trying to, to get to that place, um, to, you know, do one of those big keynotes at Dreamforce. So I think for me, like for, it was a great presentation, but it really hit me personally because I saw that and that opened up my eyes to the world of conference speaking and the opportunities to be able to do that. It was, there was so many interesting things to do that I didn't know even existed. And then I saw it and I was like, wow, like I could actually do that. Um, so for me, like that's the most inspiring because I just hold that as kind of the the always goal that I want to get to eventually. Lovely. Yes, I can, I can hear the excitement in your face <laughs> and in your voice already. So it's already coming through. Uh, and also it's matching with some of the things that we've got coming through in chat as well. You know, it's that passion, it's that ability to connect with the audience or things that um, people are picking up on. The ability to captivate an audience right from the right from the get go, being interesting uh, and engaging and projecting that uh, projecting that comfort, that confidence as well. Um, OK, so in general, I mean, we're kind of looking for themes here. Um, what is it that you're looking for? What do you think makes a great conference speaker? What is it that you would, you would, how would you answer that question, Rebecca? Um, I think what makes a great conference speaker, and I saw a lot of people putting that into the chat, is um, being able to inspire people and having that conference, that confidence. You know, people go to a conference because they want to learn something, they want to be able to take something away. So I think if you're able to share information, and people remember it the next day or it it spurs them on to take an action, then you've been a successful conference speaker and then you've been a great conference speaker. And then, you know, at conferences, there's usually a bunch of different sessions going on. So you're competing with a lot of other people and people attend, you know, five, 10 sessions in a day. So if you're the one thing that they're able to remember, then you've been successful and you've kind of been the best speaker. Be go. For me, that's kind of how, what I see as what makes a great conference speaker is being able to get your message to the audience so that they remember it. You know, that one sentence, that one message, that key takeaway. Lovely. And I like the way you're picking up on taking action afterwards as well. Otherwise, it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. You think that was great, but but nothing happens afterwards. So I guess it's that being able to motivate and, and inspire as, as well. Yeah. yeah. And so, Bonnie, what are you looking for? Because you you choose a lot of speakers, obviously for for Cisco Live. What are you What are you looking for in a in a speaker? What influences your your decision making process? I think we first look at what what session is it that we're looking for, right? And and uh, there's a big difference. And I saw uh, George just was actually putting just a question around that: how different it is, you know, to speak in front of a full conference or a smaller audience. So. If it's a keynote in front of thousands of people, uh, then, you know, it will be probably less interactive. It's more this person speaking to everyone. People will sit and, and mainly listen unless he would ask everyone to dance or to do some talks to the, one another. But basically, it's more one to many. Uh, then we would look maybe for an inspirational speaker. Uh, I mean, it's, but but not just, you know, not just a a very important person or a, you know, a celebrity, right? Someone that has something to share with the audience that as Rebecca said, would make them 
think differently, live and do something that would last longer than just until the session ends. And also that would make them feel that their time, whether it's 45, 60 minutes, sitting there was worth it, right? People come to those events, to a conference, not just to have fun. They also come to learn and to leave the event, maybe feeling slightly different from where, where they re uh, enter the event, right? So we would look for those speakers, uh, maybe not the most famous ones, not the most used ones that would go to all the conferences, but actually people that have not uh, done a, a long or a lot of mileage speaking in conferences, but the newcomers, those who would probably bloom slightly later and would inspire people with, I would say, strong message, captivating uh, presentation style, hopefully, but not necessarily, because if the content is, is captivating and important, even, even if the speaker is not amazing, but if the story is strong enough, that would kind of be, still would work, and we had a couple of examples like that. And I think what we hear a lot from our audience after some of those keynotes is it was boring, it was not, inspira it was not inspiring. So we definitely look for inspiration and, and not boring stuff as much as possible. Then when you look at the more smaller sessions uh, in our conferences, uh, it involves a lot of technical people in the networking area and IT. Uh, then we look for speakers who are, first of all, subject matter experts. So it's less about inspiration but more about you know knowledge uh, you know in in their specific area because people would come to listen to them because of what they know and what they can uh, learn from them uh, and also because of their i would also say presentation style so we keep measuring their performance we have a lot of surveys we ask the attendees the participants to rank our speakers from one to five on their level of uh, 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 on their subject matter expertise and then on their presentation style and we keep on choosing those who get the highest score or make sure that those who score low uh, go through this get well plan together with power speaking to make sure that they deliver amazingly well on the next. Yeah, I think it's great that it's not just about the experienced speakers. You're also giving newbies uh, uh, the opportunity to hit those big, big, bigger stages and, and to have exposure to this because everybody has to start somewhere and uh, yeah, it, it can still be at Cisco Live. Absolutely. So we always start by thinking about the audience. I mean, that's that's what we always teach, and I know it's 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 what uh, you do as well, Rebecca. Really thinking about what they want to get out of it. But have you got any tips that you can share? How do you know what your audience want um, before you start presenting? Yeah. Well, I think a good first thing to do, which I think a lot of speakers actually don't do is open up the event page that the audience registered on and read it. So what is that marketing team? What are they promising the audience? What are they going to get out of the day? Is it an inspirational day? Are they going to learn how to do something? So and just understanding what was promised to the audience is a really good first step. So look at that registration page, look at the invite email that was sent out to the audience so you, so you know their expectations. And then if you can speak to people that have a similar profile to your audience, you know, if I'm presenting to a bunch of service leaders, for example, I cover service, service cloud in my job, that I might speak to some service leaders that I know, some other customers that I know, whether they're going to the event or not, and say, you know, this is what I'm covering. What do you think of that? Is that helpful? So sharing that information and trying to, to gauge that interest with people that you know that have a profile similar to your audience. And then I think the last thing is making sure that your abstract and your title for your session accurately describes your session. Again, if you say you're going to do one thing, that's what the audience expects. And then if your presentation doesn't match that, then they're disappointed. So, you know, understand what's been promised to them. Be really careful and deliberate with your title and abstract so that you are telling them what they expect. And I think setting those expectations up front is really important, especially at a conference. Like I said, there's multiple different sessions. So they chose to be in your session. They want to hear the information that you said would be provided in the abstract. So if you're cautious with those things, then it, it's really easy to then tailor your session to the audience because you know, you've set yourself up for success. So I think those are some little things that people don't necessarily think about. It's not just about what's crafting in your content. It's 
the title and abstract as well. Those things are really important for determining who your audience is and making sure that you can deliver what they expect. Body, have you got anything that you would do? Yeah, what we say, we, we agree with Rebecca, what I would add to that, the challenge we, we, we see, I mean, all across the board is that not everyone actually reads what what's on the website right so people would go and 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 choose some sessions based on the speaker name because it's a very familiar i don't know engineer at cisco or or someone very, very known in the industry so they would go and listen to him even if they don't really uh, read the, the the abstract uh and they don't know what to expect and then you will get a feedback that they were disappointed because it didn't match what their expectation was even though it was all written right but i still think it's important um you know to make sure you have a strong uh, uh, uh title and abstract uh what we can do on on top of that is ask the the, the organizers to share with you the list of those who already enrolled in the recession actually like we got uh yesterday uh the people who registered for this session uh, unfortunately i didn't have the time to look you up on linkedin and, and see where are you all coming from other than seeing your company names so we can get some idea but that's you know if you're serious and you have the time, I think it's worth doing that. And also maybe try to connect even pre-event, if possible, depending on the organization, if, if they open like all, all kinds of uh, chat spaces per session, like we do at Cisco Live, you could actually start communicating with your audience, with your participant before the event and, and see what they're expecting to hear and even, you know, tailor your presentation accordingly to a certain extent. Yeah, absolutely. You can stalk them, they don't know. <laughs> and if you're able to send a survey out beforehand, again, I think it depends on the size of your event, but if you can send out a survey, we do that for some of our smaller events to say like, what do you want to get of this session? Prioritize these things. So that that's all really helpful depending on if it's, you know, a 50 person event or a 10,000 person conference. <laughs> sort of depends if you can do it or not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I was working with um, a, a team recently and they were going to do a, a team presentation um, for an event soon. And they realized during our rehearsal that they had no interest at all and they really didn't like one of the things that they promised to deliver. So we realized then that they had to go back to the organizers and get that changed because it wasn't something that they had planned. It didn't match the talk that they were giving. And uh, it really wasn't something they, have, they felt passionately about. So it is important to make sure that bio, and not the bio, sorry, that what you're promising, uh, wherever it is, whether it's within an app or um, whether it's being sent out in advance, that it does match the session that you're the giving. Otherwise, people feel very disappointed. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, should we pause just for a moment? Are there any things coming through um, in chat that I need to be aware of? Um, well... You do have a fan here, Sarah, who saw you at the Women of Silicon Roundabout. And then um, Gail asks, and I, I'm sure you have some experience with this, um, for a conference as a whole, how do you go about choosing an MC, uh, a Master of Ceremonies? Uh -huh. Okay, well, I'll open that up to the, the team. What views do you have? How, how would you go about choosing your, your Master of Ceremonies? What are you looking for in somebody for the, in that role? Um, I can go first if you want. So usually when we're thinking about an MC, because um, in my marketing role, I also do a lot of planning who the other speakers are as well as, well as speaking. Um, I think with an MC, like they have to carry you through the day. So for us, we look for someone that's engaging, entertaining, fun, keeps the energy up, you know, conferences are long, they can be tiring. So it's really about someone that has that engaging energy. Um, they don't have to be an expert in, in something specific that the conference is about. For, for us, often the MC is someone that can help bring the energy, you know, make people laugh, um, create a great atmosphere for the day. So for us, we're looking for that kind of like personality, that type of presenting style and someone as well that can, you know, think off the cuff and respond to things that are happening. Um, so they don't need to have everything scripted. Mm -hmm. That That's key things to look for if you're searching for an MC versus a session speaker. They're very different types of speakers. Yeah. Interact with the audience in the moment and uh, be prepared to be a bit playful sometimes as well and 
keep not only their own energies up, but I think it's everybody else's as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Same for Cisco Live? Uh, same, but not exactly the same. Uh, because, I mean, on, if you look at our main stage, we only use it for an opening session and the closing session. So there's one session on day one and there's one session on the last day. We spent quite a lot of money on that stage, but we don't really use it a lot during the week, which is a shame. Uh, so we don't really need an MC for that because, again, most of the sessions are more technical and, and, and smaller sessions like 40 simultaneous sessions going on at every moment so we don't need that but actually we do have a program for it managers which is called it leadership with around 1000 people where we do have mcs but but these mcs are internal people and usually what they've started doing in the last few years is using some young early in career people from cisco to volunteer go through some internal tests and be the mcs and they're actually doing a pretty good job uh, especially as you described, so I'm not exactly script and very playful and approachable. And that has been working really well for us. Nice. Very nice. So hopefully that answers your question. Fantastic. Right. So let's get down to talking about nerves, because this comes up time and time again, whenever I'm coaching people, people say, how can I look as confident as a confident speaker does? How can I manage, uh, manage those nerves? So, um, what what, if, what have you done about this or what would you recommend, uh, Rebecca? So first, don't be scared of being nervous. Being nervous is absolutely normal. I still get a little nervous before I go on stage. Every single presenter I know, whether present, presenting for five years or 20 years, you know, those two minutes before you go on, you're like, what have I done? So that is totally normal. And it's a good thing, actually. It's your body preparing you for something important. You're about to do something important. And those nerves are going to give you energy to really shine on stage to, you know, to keep you going. So first, I would say expect to be nervous. You should be nervous. It's a good thing. But there are things that you can do to help manage that. So one thing is practicing as much as you can. And so I usually say there's you know, if you get really nervous, there's two things that you should do. So first practice so that you know your content back to front. And you'll hear me say that throughout the session. I think that you should practice. And so if all tech fails, you can deliver your presentation. So that should help you be less nervous because you really know your content. I would say two other things is pick someone that you really admire and ask them for you know, half an hour of their time to practice to them. Someone that you really want to impress, that you would be nervous. And oftentimes presenting in front of one person that you really care about impressing is far scarier than presenting in front of 500 people or 5,000 people. So if you can do that, then you can do the, you know, the big stage. So I'd say practice your content in front of someone that's important that you want to impress, get their feedback, make sure you feel comfortable with that. And then the other thing is be comfortable with the stage. You know, you're a speaker, so you, you're you allowed to ask, like, I want some time on the stage before my session, whether it's the night before, early in the morning. I never go onto a stage without at least as much as I can without walking on it once. So you don't want the first time you stand on that stage and see how many chairs are out there to be as you're giving your presentation. So practice once on the stage, do a proper dry run practice so that you know your content back to front and then practice to someone that's a little intimidating to you. So if you can do those three things, then you can definitely deliver a presentation easily. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Bonnie, I, a little bird told me that uh, something amazing happened to you last year at, or earlier this year in Cisco Live, and they certainly overcame your nerves. Uh, it's a small group today. Do you mind sharing that? Sure, not exactly a presentation, but usually, and, and I think we discussed it earlier, I mean, if you don't have some level of nerves or if, if your heart rate doesn't go up before you go on stage, then you shouldn't be presenting, I think, because I mean, even here in a panel, in a very comfortable and, and secure environment, there is still some nervousness in, in how it's going to go. But definitely when you speak in front of 120 people, 2000 doesn't matter your heartbeat should go up a little bit and, and you should use uh, those nerves to your advantage to a certain extent, right? Step a little bit out of your comfort zone. I, I would usually open a presentation putting the music on or something to re to make me like make an entrance and then relate it to the story I'm going to tell. Uh, personally for me, uh, I'm, I'm usually behind the scenes. I'm making sure that the stage is set up for all the amazing speakers we have at the event. 
with all of those stages because we have a lot of stages but i do get to speak as well uh when we before the first day of the session was we having this brief for the temps and all the uh, the people all the stuffers for the event so i used to give uh, i i get to give those those um sessions but this year actually also went on stage uh, at the closing party and, and actually uh, I joined the band and, and uh, singing a song in front of like 5,000 uh, uh, drunk uh, customers and partners and employees. Some of them were drunk. And that's something that I've never done before. Uh, but the opportunity came. Uh, they, I saw on the playlist a song that I really like and I asked them if I can sing it with them. And because I was the one who paid them, they said, yeah, you can do it with us. So... Uh, and I, I didn't think about it too much. I, I said I have to be a bit stupid doing that, but at the same time, I don't care. That's that's a safe environment for me where I can do that. I mean, a lot of people in the crowd, they had no clue who I am, and they still don't know who I am, which is fine. But uh, I did it, and the, the, the feedback was okay overall. Maybe behind the back, everyone said it was awful, but to me, it seems that people were happy with that. So, I mean, one, one way to actually, you know, uh, tackle nervousness is just to, to deal with it. So, and, and not, not to be afraid to do something because you have nerves, actually use the nerves, be prepared. Uh, like Rebecca said, uh, yeah. prepare as much as you can, maybe don't overthink it too much, but write the, the bullet points that you want to say, you can try to script it even to the word. Uh, I used to do it sometimes, uh, putting it on a note or on a word document, exactly how I'm going to build each slide. And I like to use a lot of animation and stuff, but I. Anytime I do that, I never use the, uh, the script when I come on, when I go on stage because by then I remember it by heart almost, and the slides also help me to memorize and remember what I'm about to say. So that also helps alleviate the the level of nervousness. Yeah, nice, and congratulations as well for singing on stage. I'm gutted I missed that bit. I, I think what what I'm hearing here is it, it's about being natural, isn't it? It's about being yourself. And recognizing that, of course, you're going to feel nervous because everybody does. But if you just channel that in a different way, um, I remember seeing Simon Sinek interviewed and asked about nerves. And he said, of course, he gets nervous, even though he's delivered so many you know, presentations to huge audiences. But he said he was worked out that his body responds in the same way. Those slightly sweaty palms, heart beating a bit faster, stomach churning. Um, and it's the same whether he's nervous or excited. So you just say to yourself, "Hey, I'm, I'm excited," and it's a much more positive energy to go on to go on stage with. Um, and I and I think that really helps. But if you try and fight those nerves, then they're, they're only going to get worse. So, work, as you said, Bonnie, work work with them is always great. Uh, okay, you can see Marion's just put a message in chat as well, saying she's very interested in creating a presentation for a conference later this year. Have you got any good tips to help plan and organize um, what she wants to talk about? I think um, that depends first on the theme of <clears throat> what the conference is. So I would start with kind of, you know, what is the theme of the conference? And then what does that theme mean to you? Mean to you? So a lot of the times when you're thinking about presenting something, it's, you know, what is that knowledge that you have that the audience doesn't have that they want? And so starting with that and then building your story around that. And usually the way that I'll try and kind of build a story for a conference is thinking about, okay, this theme, let's say it's AI, for example, then you're like, okay, well, what's happening in the world today around AI? What are the possibilities? How are like what's the challenge to get us to those possibilities what's the solution what are some examples you know what's the proof point that whatever you're then trying to tell them your how to guide your product your service why is that going to get you there so kind of thinking about that structure but again it d really depends on on what the theme of the conference is what the theme of your your topic is yeah. Uh, that one one suggestion to that, and and I know Sarah, you have a question about it later on. Uh, I would strongly recommend you you put a sim uh, the same question with the topic that you want to present on, and and uh, put it uh, uh, on Chat GPT. I used the free version last week. I had to deliver a presentation about uh, the world of events or conferences for 
kids at college age at 19 years old my daughter uh, asked me to to go and 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 kind of deliver a 90 minute or 60 minute session uh among some other sessions and i knew what i was about to say but i just tested with chat gpt and i asked chat gpt to recommend a structure of a presentation a 60 minute presentation to 19 year old kids about the art of uh, events and the importance of of events for them and actually it gave me an amazing structure with like five different chapters closing uh ending i didn't use it because i i, I just did it for to test for the fun but I, I i would actually recommend trying it for free i mean not not a paid version even uh that that's an amazing what connections it can make between different stuff that you put in yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, yes, you're right. I had a, had a question about this later. So why do we speak about this this now? What are your thoughts, uh, Rebecca, on Chat GPT? Is it is it going to replace speakers or? No, I don't. Th- I don't think it's going to replace speakers. Um, people like hearing speakers because they want that human connection. Um, but I 100% agree with Bonnie. I think Chat GPT and other generative AI is great for augmenting the tools that a a speaker has in their toolkit. So writing your abstract for you, and then you can tweak it, giving you 10 different ideas, giving you a framework for your presentation. You know, other generative AI can help make your presentations look beautiful with one or two clicks. So I think it's a great tool for presenters to use to help kind of widen their scope. It's like, instead of holding a brainstorm with 10 people, you just hold a brainstorm with chat GPT. So I think in that way, like it's incredibly helpful for a speaker and for a, pre- for a presenter. I don't definitely don't think it'll replace the actual speaking part because again, most people want to hear and connect with humans. I mean, that's for conferences, for example, that's why we go to conferences. That's why we like the in-person conferences because we want to shake people's hand and sit next to them. So I don't think it's going to replace presenters in any way but i think absolutely if you're not already using chat gpt and generative ai then you're missing a trick because it's an amazing tool to have in your toolkit as a presenter i like the idea of it being part of a toolkit it's certainly something that uh, i've thought of of using for a talk that i have to uh, i'm giving uh, next month in amsterdam for women in tech and uh, i I haven't done it yet because I haven't looked at my talk yet, but when I do, I'm de- definitely going to use it for ideas. But I think at the end of the day, you have to feel comfortable with the words you're using. It has to be right for that audience. And uh, you've got to be able to interact with the audience as well. And you can't do that if it's too heavily scripted. Plus, I can't remember a script anyway, so <laughs> that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work for me at all. If, you could, uh, if I could add to that, so talk about... Uh, uh... I think there's like when you prepare for a presentation, I think G- chat GPT cannot replace your, who you are as a person, right? Your unique approach, your knowledge, right? But it can definitely help you make connections that you can't see. I mean, Rebecca said, instead of talking to 10 different people, actually talking to chat GPT is like you're talking to a million people at the same time, because the, the amount of knowledge and, and the <laughs> knowledge that, that that tool has is amazing, right? And it's there. For you, then, based on the recommendations, whatever the outcome of the of, of the chat is, you need to pull from that chat what makes sense for you, what works for you. So, for example, uh, if even if you do a short bio for a session that you're going to present in, take this bio, even if it's a hundred word, just put it at ChatGPT and ask the chat to to work on it a little bit and make it more professional or more impressive, what have you. You will get some amazing results. But then I would go, I, I did it myself actually, not for this session, for another one. And I went in and just picked what makes sense because obviously a lot of the words are not words that I would use usually, right? So you need to use it as another tool in the toolbox, but it can help you really in specific areas. Let's say, for example, you want to make a strong uh, ending for your session, you have some ideas, it can give you a very specific options for that, okay? And it goes when you prepare, I mean, there's this... One, a salesperson in Cisco already said, you need to start with the knowledge. Once you have the knowledge, then comes the confidence. And when you have the confidence, you can take risks. He was talking about salespeople, but I actually thought about it earlier today. I said it, 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 work, it works amazingly the same for present, presenting. 
you first of all need to have the knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge, then don't go on stage. That that would be my recommendation, right? Because if you have the knowledge, then you know, no matter what the, the audience would ask you, you are the master of your area, right? So you're standing there in front of them because you know your stuff and you can almost tackle almost every question. And if not, you should know what to say about it. And even, I don't know, it's also fine, right? Uh, so you have the confidence and then it allows you to take the next step, which is doing something slightly crazy or take some risks by not doing it in, in the way that everyone does it. And then it's where you make your, your lasting impact on the audience. Yeah, I like that. You get, you can you can go right of center or left of center and it can come up with a whole range of different ideas. At the end of the day, it's what feels authentically you and what would be right for this for this audience. But a fantastic tool to play around with and see what comes up. So yeah, why not? We were talking about nerves as well um, and how to calm yourself before you even go on stage. Also like to think about some mistakes that people make. So what mistakes are people making that we want to avoid? Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes is not knowing your content enough, not practicing enough. Like I said, at least the standard that I hold myself to is that if all tech fails, you should still be able to deliver your presentation. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be exactly script to script, but you should know your story. You should know your key messages enough that you can just stand there and deliver it. And if you have that level of preparation, then you're going to be able to deliver it calmly. You're not going to speak so fast. Like you can start to take care of those other things. But I think if people don't know their content, they're fumbling over their words, they, you know, freeze, they don't know what to say, or something goes wrong. Like I've been on stages all the time where the projector stops working or the comfort screen breaks and I can't see what's behind me or the demo breaks. Like that happens to me. That's happened to me so many times. And to be able to work through it with your audience, like still bring, you can still bring them along on, on your journey. That's really important. So I think the number one stake is not preparing enough. You should prepare. Like I think of going to going up on stage is, you know, that's like the finals of the big game. Like you should be practicing all the time that's your brand that's your reputation so it is a big deal and you should prepare accordingly and then i think some of those you know like i said talking too fast stumbling over your words things like that those things will go away with preparation um uh, yeah how about you bonnie what do you, what, what do you think what what do you want your speakers to avoid doing so everything as rebecca mentioned of course uh to add to, or to 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 add to that I would say, first of all, uh, reading from slides, uh, that's a basic one. I mean, if, if all you say is written on the slides, then there's no reason for you to be there, right? People can read the slides and, and get the same. They need to get, you need to give them something that is not on the slides and that is additional to that, right? And that's where the story, storytelling comes in and, and your personality, right? Bring something of yourself. No one is a robot. We all have, I mean, some are more extrovert, some are introvert, but we all have our way of, of, of delivering presentations. And if you chose to do it, uh, and unless assuming no one was forcing you to do it, then, then make the most out of it. Definitely prepare. Um, I think for us, we have a lot of non-native English speakers, all the conferences being uh, delivered in English uh, and people, uh, I mean, some people are doing it cleverly and they actually take advantage of their non-English accent, especially the French people. They know how to laugh about themselves, make some jokes and stuff but not make it the major point of the session, right? As long as you are, you know, the expert on your topic and you deliver an, an engaging and, and you connect with the audience, then they won't care about your accent. If you get a lot of comments that you are, uh, you have a French accent or you talk too slow or too quick, then maybe you're, you're not interesting enough. And then that's, that's why they would give you that feedback. And the other one is actually, again, speaking too fast. We had a lot of sessions last year coming out of COVID. We changed the format of the sessions in our event in the US last year in June, where we said instead of 90 minutes or two hours, all sessions are 45 minutes because we thought, and that's what we hear from the, the world outside of Cisco, sessions need to be shorter, span of attention, et cetera, et cetera. 
And actually, it didn't work for our audience. Our audience still wanted the longer sessions. And some speakers tried to condense into 45 minutes content for 90 minutes. So they literally had like hundreds of slides and they were like rushing through the slides. And obviously, that's not going to work. So if you know you have 30 minutes or 45 minutes, make sure that the content that you have would fit in it and that you would end ideally five minutes shorter and leave some time for a Q&A, for example. I wish I got paid extra for every time I've told somebody that uh, less is more. You, know, you can say more by saying less rather than this is everything I know on the topic. So I better speak really, really fast at all this audience so that they get it because they, yeah, they don't get it. It's uh, about really tailoring it to the to the time. Some yeah, some great advice there. It is fun. We've also got a couple of comments coming in. As an audience, I've never wanted to speak and to fail. Absolutely. The audience want the other speakers to succeed. Um, and it's worth reminding yourself when you get on stage. Um, thank you for that, Zayda. That's a valid, valid point. Your audience are all there waiting and hoping that this is going to be successful. And uh, it's not about you. It's about your your content. So what I try and do is really focus on the audience. I try and be the person that they need me to be rather than focusing on, you know, are my hands shaking or are my knees knocking again or whatever else I, I worry about. It's just really being who they need to be. So that leads me on to can you fake it? Can you fake a confidence on stage? And, and if so, how can you do that? Who would like to take that one? Um, I can take that one first and then I'll let Bonnie finish off. We've got that kind of rhythm now. <laughs> so I think, um, yes, a hundred percent, you can fake confidence. Again, you're going to hear me say this a million times, but that comes from practicing so that, um, you can, even if you are, you know, nervous, you're not a confident speaker, you can come across confidently. Um, and another thing that I do is I don't just practice my script i actually physically practice my presentations i think about where i'm going to stand i always walk the stage i think having a presence using gestures walking the stage is really important but you don't want to just make that up on the fly as you're up there so just like in a play you know the actors they don't just learn the script they learn the physical movement that they're going to do on the stage for me it's the same when i'm doing a presentation you know where am I standing when I'm presenting this slide? As I transition, am I walking over to the middle of the stage? Am I walking over to the right side of the stage? So I physically practice that as well. So it's practicing the script and the physical movement so that you can actually take up space because taking up space is what's going to make you appear more confident. And when you're on a big stage, you look really small. So even though it might feel uncomfortable, you might feel strange, like walking around or moving your arms. It doesn't look strange when you're on a big stage. So I think, you know, really taking up space as much as you can and do not stand behind a podium unless you need to physically be at your laptop if you're driving a demo or something. Otherwise, get away from the podium. Don't lean on the podium. All of those things can make you appear really shy, like you're hiding yourself. And when you're on stage, if you want to fake your confidence, you have to go out there, you know, with your arms open and, and ready to receive the audience. Yeah, I used to call it the white knuckle ride. You could see speakers holding on to that podium and their knuckles would be white as they gripping the hold of it. And uh, it made it hard. It isn't always easy to do, but the more you get, used to it then uh, it does it does get a lot easier how about you bonnie yeah i think you can fake it but then you have to have this certain level of confidence and knowledge in what you're saying so that i mean you can't 100 percent fake it, right there there needs to be some genuine appearance right so to, so it's it's a confidence but mixed with some emotions with some nervousness um, how you make the most out of it. Yeah, I mean, I admire Rebecca for really practicing uh, uh, her moves on stage. I've never done it well. I've never really presented in front of thousands of people. And usually I like to improvise a little bit. As long as I know what I would like to say and I have like a slight deck ready, I, I would go and, and, and slightly improvise on that. Um, but but actually being on stage is like, is like acting to a certain extent, right? 
Uh, so there's there's always a, a some 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 percentage of it is is fake. It's not it's not really how I am in my in my day to day, right? Uh, usually I work from home, and I'm not. No one is looking at me other than my kids, but they ignore me most of the time, right? So it's not the same. And then you have this crowd. Uh, all eyes are on you. Uh, so I think it's it's faking it a little bit, but also being open with the audience. So if you're nervous, so if you're I don't know. You can share with them that uh, actually my heartbeat now is a uh, hundred, and usually it's sixty. I don't know. I mean, even stuff like that to make them know. I mean, I'm I'm a human being as much as uh, just like everyone else, and and you know, help me go through that. Right? Be gentle with me. Um, and I also think again, it, it's it's just you know practicing and practicing, and and as you said at the end of the day, they all come to listen to you and, and, and they want you to succeed, right? No one wants you to fail. So, uh, so fake it a little bit, but, but, uh, as, as long as, uh, I mean, the more you do it, the less you need to fake. Basically. Yeah. And I think a good thing to remember as well is that you're on that stage for a reason. Like you didn't just stumble up there. There was probably a lot of people that had to approve you to be the person that's on that stage, which means all those other people believe in you. So you know, you're there for a reason. Other people believe in you. You should be confident in that. I think that's a big thing that people forget is how much happened before you got onto that stage. Like all these people believe that you can do it. That's why they're giving you the space to do the presentation. So you should believe in yourself as much as, you know, everyone else does. I think that's really important. And also, again, very easy to forget. I've seen some really introvert speakers, um, but have done amazingly, amazingly well because they've learned how to take up space. They've learned how to slow down what they're saying. And it may be because they're they're thinking and they need thinking time themselves, but it comes across as super confident. And at the end of it, they might feel exhausted because it takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, but it, it's amazing how people can change. And you don't have to always say you don't have to change who you are the rest of the time. It's just whilst you're up there, you need a certain level of energy and a few things like just taking up space, slowing down, looking the audience in the eyes can make such a difference. And these are all things that, that you can learn and, and as you said, um, practice. And yeah, if your heartbeats get racing, why not tell them? I could be playful with the audience. And again, that that makes you makes you feel good. But you don't want to make the audience feel uncomfortable by saying, I'm terrified up here. <laughs> um, that, 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 that tends not to work. We said at the beginning that uh, your audience decide very quickly when you're up there whether they are going to like this talk or not. So obviously you want to have a way of capturing their attention and helping them relax right from the right from the get go, right from the beginning. So, um, what what have you seen done, or what advice have you got? And I'll, I'll ask Bonnie first of all because I feel like he's always picking up <laughs> picking up us. Well, I'm going to with the rhythm because I know we have different answers to that one, uh, but I'm happy to go first on this one. Uh, again, it's, there's no one size fits all or, or a secret formula that, that you can all adopt, right? It's, it's really bringing your, I mean, who you are, a bit of your personality to the, to the presentation, to the session, uh, even if it's a boring content or hopefully not, right? But, but I mean, even if you have a deck to present, uh, and, and, you know, each and every one would present it slightly differently. Um, I always use something, I have this, uh, it's not a secret. It's a formula that, uh, that we came uh to to work with a few years ago which is all about actually delivering events in general not just presentations but actually think about it early today i thought it would work for presentations as well and it's it's basically small medium large and huge okay s m l h and the h stands for hospitality and in the case of a session again it's less in the hands of the speaker but it's all about the i mean how comfortable is the room the temperature the the chairs the screen the audio video whatever right it needs to be and that, you know, that's our responsibility, the, the event planners, to make sure that it works. But assuming this is good, then you have small, medium, large. Large is all about listen and learn. And that's about, you know, getting feedback from the audience before and even during your session. Because when I remember I was presenting uh, in China, like 20 years ago, I presented in front of 200, 300 people. 
I had no idea what's going, what, what was happening. I spoke for an hour, no feedback. It was terrible, right? For them, for me, I mean, I have no idea how, how bad it was or how good it was. So listen and learn during a session, pre and post and post session to, I mean, to, to understand how can I be better? What was missing? Any ideas? M is meaningful. And it's one of the things we said here, the, the content needs to be meaningful and relevant for the audience. So you need to, to know who your audience is, what are you going to talk about? And the S, and that relates to the opening, it's the surprise factor, right? Uh, if you have this level of knowledge and confidence and you can take risks, I like to surprise people when I'm on stage and not just me, I mean others as well and make some fun in a way that is appropriate for the audience. So it could be making a, a Mexican wave like in the Football uh, World Cup that one of our speakers always does in his session. I'm not doing it. That's not who I am, but uh, he likes to do that. Or it could be posing up uh, an opening slide that would make them think, hey, what is this? So for example, I gave in the presentation I gave uh, uh, for the staffers in the event that we did in February this year, my first slide was actually dated from February 5, 2021. Because I, I had this slide there since February 5, 2021, which is the event we were supposed to deliver. And because of COVID got canceled. So I had the deck ready for two years. I decided to keep the first opening slide, the same one and see if anyone sees the difference. Then they start, I don't know, looking at each other, what's going on. And then I give them the explanation and I start from that. And the surprise can be in very, I mean, in all kinds of forms and shapes in the opening, during the session at the end, as long as it's relevant, right? So don't make things that are completely out of, out of scope and not relevant, but, but give them some surprise element that would make them, you know, kind of focus their attention on you and, and feel like, okay, this is going to be a great session. Nice. Yeah, I agree. I think really making sure that you showcase your personality, people tend to kind of decide if they like you within the first 10 to 15 seconds of you getting on stage. So I think leading with your personality first, um, you want to make sure that you're introducing yourself, but, you know, coming up with something kind of fun at the start too. So like if I, I'm an energetic person, so I'll always start with like, oh, I'm so excited to be here. I present in a lot of different countries. So for example, I was in South Africa before it was my first time. So I was like, so excited to be sharing this content with you, but I'm more excited to be in South Africa. You know, I've never been here before and everyone's been so warm and welcoming. And then everyone applauded, you know, because in South Africa, they're, they're really proud of their country and their culture. So connecting with them and, you know, thanking the audience, I think is great. Or you can lead with a joke if it makes sense. There was one time I was presenting um, during one of our Dreamforce events in San Francisco and we had Barack Obama doing a session at the same time as mine <laughs> so you know I started off I'm like it's not very often that you're competing with the president of the United States for your audience session time so um, I think being able to kind of like acknowledge things that are happening there's a presenter um, at Salesforce Ed Thompson I present a lot of keynotes with him and he was an analyst at Gartner for over 20 years he's very analytical, really smart. And he always starts his presentations talking about like logos, pathos, and ethos, which is like, who am I? What am I going to say? And why should I care? And starting off with something kind of so like smart and analytical, like it, it shows his personality right away. And you're like, okay, this is a guy that studies and talks about things like logos, pathos, and ethos. So you start to get to really understand someone's personality. And you know, even if you don't feel comfortable doing any of that and you just want to introduce yourself, the best thing to do is smile when you get on stage. I think that the, there's nothing worse than someone getting up and then kind of staring at you shocked as they introduce themselves. So smile, look like you're happy to be there and people will, you know, join you in your in your journey through your session. Absolutely. And I love it when you smile, people smile back at you and then that relaxes you because you think, pin up it, it's good. I am gutted for you, Rebecca. Barack Obama was not free to come to your session, but he was actually at the event. So what a shame. I know, exactly. He would have loved it, but he, he would have loved it. What he meant. Uh, okay, fantastic. Some really good advice. Okay, we've got a one last question that we could take here. And uh, that's what's the difference when presenting to a virtual or a hybrid audience? 
So any advice on that? I know um, Cisco Live is, is uh, usually face-to-face, but I know that uh, you've also, during the pandemic, had to look at uh, other versions as well. Um, and Rebecca, you've probably got experience in, in both. So don't mind who wants to take this one first. Um, yeah, I can go first. So um, they're pretty different. I think the experience as a presenter for me, like I personally, I'm very extroverted. So I get a lot of energy from being on stage and I like to be able to see people's faces and their reactions. Um, and so there's a lot of energy to work with when you're on stage, just in the room. When you're presenting virtually, it can be a lot more difficult because you're often just have like your kitchen, empty kitchen in front of you or, or, you know, an office wall. So you really have to keep that energy going, especially if you're presenting a session that's longer, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes. I know at Cisco, they do hour and a half sessions. So keeping that energy going when you're in a virtual environment, I think is um, is a very different experience than being on stage, having all of the production and having those faces kind of nodding and agreeing and, and looking back at you. Um, I don't think that you should practice any less. I think you should still, you know, practice the full amount. I wouldn't have any notes. I'm not a fan of, you know, notes on the screen when you're trying to deliver a virtual presentation. I think you should deliver it at the same level and prepare at the same level as you would if you were in a physical presentation. It's just as important. Um, whether you're in person or virtual, again, it's your brand, it's your reputation that you're showcasing to the world. So prepare accordingly. Yeah, to add to that, I think, I mean, the first answer that popped my mind was, I mean, when you're presenting remotely, usually, again, like with you, we're sitting, right? And it's a big difference when you're sitting and, and uh, they don't see your whole body. It's, it's a very different experience. So I, I've seen a lot of people actually doing this, uh, even if it's a remote meeting or remote presentation, they would stand and do it, uh, standing, even standing still, or actually moving a little bit. Uh, but to add to that, I think, um, I think the question was also about if, if people are speaking at conference that is in person and virtual together, and we've seen those uh, sessions where the session is going on, the speaker is in the room, you have people in the room face to face, but there's also people joining remotely. That makes things a bit more complicated. Uh, we actually haven't done it yet for Cisco Live, so we either did it only virtual during the pandemic, and since we came back to face-to-face, to -face, we're only doing it face-to-face. -face. We don't really put uh, virtual attendance into the technical sessions. We do broadcast the the, the big keynote sessions, but uh, it's very different there. The focus is still on the in-person uh, attendees, on those who come, uh, invest most of their time and money to come to the event, so they're, they're our first priority. But I do think as uh, from our perspective, I mean, if you are, if you know you're in a conference, you're in a room, you're presenting in front of people and you also have uh, people attending remotely, you, my recommendation is definitely to have a moderator next to you, like one of your colleagues, another subject matter expert that would monitor everything that is going on the, on the virtual um, stream. Uh, if there are any important questions, then he would pose it to you. You can make a pause every 15, 20 minutes and see if there's anything uh, important from the, the virtual audience. But still, the focus will be on the people that, that came and made the effort to come and be there with you, right? So uh, if you're only around, it's going to be super challenging because you can't focus on both at the same time. My recommendation would be focus on the people in the room, get a second person to help you with those who are remote. Yeah, I agree with Bonnie. And I think it depends on the setup. So is it, like you said, the main conference is the people that are physically there and everyone else is being broadcasted to watch? Or is it like, you know, more of a TV show setup where the people there, the in-studio audience, but the main conference is actually virtual and then adjusting accordingly? So are you speaking to the audience? Are you speaking to the camera? And the, you know, the people are just in person getting to watch this all being filmed so it really depends on who your main audience is and then kind of presenting to them and and also like the production team should help with where to put cameras to make sure that they're capturing your face and being able to get those close-ups as well so that it's a great experience virtually as well as in person so i don't think it's all on the presenter there like the production team will have a lot to do with what that experience looks like 
a lot more a lot more balls to a lot more balls to juggle yeah and, <laughs> yeah I can't believe that we've been chatting now for nearly an hour so we need to bring this to a close and, and release this audience um come on I have one sentence from each of you just as your your final your final words of advice if you can get that down to one sentence you will be my friend for life um practice as much as you can practice makes I think we're the speaker it's competence and confidence combined and you get those things from knowing your subject matter and practicing so those are my my two things lovely thank you Bonnie yeah I'm going back to one of my earliest uh, comments around knowledge confidence and and risk but I would maybe change I mean knowledge confidence and then surprise Nice. Lovely. Thank you both so much for your words of wisdom and your time today. It's been really appreciated. Thank you too to the audience for joining us. This has all been recorded. Uh, all the links are in chat. So if you'd like to uh, look at the recording, also we're going to be doing blogs from this. So do sign up for our insights so that you can see the rest of it. And our next event is going to be From Fearful to Courageous Presenting. So if you'd like to sign up for that, we'd love to see you there. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's been fantastic.